Hello, everybody. Welcome to another um, podcast of uh, Christian Living Australia. We are here today to bring to you uh, X6. It's the next chapter of X. We hope you um, have a wonderful time with us. Um, explore the depths and the truths of the Bible. Um, uh, my name is Abel. And this is my Greta, my wife. We are um, doing it together. Uh, send questions for us in the comment section. If you have questions, we will try and answer as much as possible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how privileged we are to have the book of Acts, which not only identifies many good practices to follow, but also many pitfalls to avoid. We pray that we may be instant in season and out of season, make time to pray in accordance with your will, and be careful to study the word of God, so that we may mature in faith and grow in the grace which you provide. But we also pray that we would be obedient to your word, listen to your instruction, and obey your command, so that we may work the works of God, and that you may be glorified in our lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start um, our reading of Acts chapter 6, the New International Version, from verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. A Hellenist was a person that was not born in Judea. They were not from Judea, but they were Jewish. And they were usually somewhere in the Roman Empire, but they did not live in the borders of Israel. And they were Greek-speaking um, Jews, but they did not speak Aramaic. And this is, again, when you can see in God's wisdom, the day when um, the 120 that was in the room received the Holy Spirit, that it was different languages that God gave them first, because the word of God went to the Jews first. And there was many different type of languages that the Jews speak. They were not just Aramaic or Hebrew-speaking Jews in the world at that stage. They spoke different languages, and they lived in different parts of this world. As we know by now, the church in Jerusalem is still growing, and some of the members are from Jerusalem and from um, surrounding areas. Some are from as far as way as Rome to the west and Mesopotamia to the east. Those who are from the west are called Hellenists. Since the day of the Pentecost, the Jesus followers have supported the visitors. So when the Christians now still come to the feast, they are financially supported by the church. So the Greek-speaking Jesus followers in Jerusalem are upset. They feel the church is not providing equal distribution of charity for some Greek-speaking widows compared to Aramaic-speaking widows. It is understandable that the apostles would not notice at this point because they, at this specific time, were very busy. They were going from home to home. They were on the mount um, the Temple Mount nearly every single day and we were trying, point number one, not to get arrested, try to stay alive and spread the word of Jesus as Jesus commanded them to do. The Hellenist action is described using by the Greek root word gogismos. The modern English word we will think will be complaint, but this is not quite what it means here. And this was not a formal complaint that they did. They didn't stand in front of the apostles and made a formal complaint. No, this is not what these people did. They were unhappy and they were grumbling and murmuring and gossiping under, under their breath all around. So they actually went and complained about their problems every single way except go and stand in front of the apostles and give them a formal complaint. Hi viewers, let's, vis let's continue by reading at uh, Acts 6 verse 2. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, 
The church numbers in this moment is in the thousands already. And the apostles are seeking to even evangelize more, tens of thousands. So we can see that the numbers of people uh, are growing and the interest in, in the new Christian faith is, is quite big. Um, people streaming to hear from new hear from the apostles about uh, Jesus' works. Um, this is exactly what Jesus tasked these disciples to do, is to spread his story. And we can read about Acts 1 verse 8, a very pro popular, pro uh, well-known verse. So far they've been quite faithful to the thousands in the church and as well as the Jews who uh, gather in the temple courts in Acts 4, verse 4 and 33. Jesus did not task the disciples with meeting the new disciples, disciples' physical requirements. Acts 6, 6 verse 3 Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. Verse 4 And will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Although the passage doesn't use the word, this is the establishment of the office of deacon in a church. Now, diakonia is the Greek word from which the word ministry comes. And specifically refers to the role of the deacons, uh, people who collect and disperse resources, uh, in, and is also used in a, in a more general sense. Uh, next 20 verse 24 in a general sense means um, fulfilling roles that is uh, of lesser of lesser um, responsibility than what the elders and the and the leaders of the church perform but it's roles that are important that has to be done there is nothing wrong with the system uh, of management if the group is small and the members is diligent and attentive there are now thousands of Jesus followers. Just can't keep track of everyone. They, it's just too many. Um, that's where they, um, the Holy Spirit bring in the, the additional roles. The church leaders need some kind of a structure to, to help them manage these, these, these groups and mobs of, of, of thousands of people coming to Christ. Not only are the apostles willing to hand over their responsibilities for management of money and assets, they are also willing to let those choose the candidates who will do so. After all, these people have to be chosen to make sure that they are fit for the role and they have the right skill and, and talents to do the role. Uh, today's leadership structure of a church is, is very different than that in the Old Testament. However, God set aside the people of the tribe of Levi to serve him in, 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 in Bible time. He designated that priests would come from the line of Aaron, while the other Levite families had specific duties regarding the tabernacle. Um, you want to read more about that? Go to Numbers chapter 3, and all the way from 21, verse 21 to verse 37. We'll explain exactly what, uh, what this is about. Uh, their tasks were basically uh, based on what family these um, people belong to in those days as a family heritage and um, is, is significant of what tasks these people needs to fill today however it's a different story today's church however the leadership is based on the um, on the family by character of that person we go to 1 timothy 3 verse 8 to 13 um, it lays out the qualifications for the deacons quite clearly uh, specifically to what needs to be done and what uh, needs to, uh, these people need to have to be able to become a deacon. Most of this which deal with integrity is the main characteristic integrity. Now, while deacons need to be spiritually mature, as in any church leader should be, the apostles specifically need to know um, they will be able to handle the finances with honesty and responsibility. That is a, it's a very important role, especially when it comes to money. I um, don't know if you know, but I've experienced my life that money brings out the bad in people. It's a, the root cause of evil is money. And that's why it's so important 
that uh, it's been dealt with correctly and with great responsibility. Let's continue our reading from verse 5 to 6. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles and prayed and laid their hands on them. Church chooses good men who have a good reputation, wisdom, and has the Holy Spirit. The wording here resembles passages where Jesus' followers lay money and resources before the apostles. The congregation is dedicating these seven men to minister as the apostles see fit. The apostles turn around and give the men authority to decide how they will address the problems that will come in the future. The apostles can do this because of their dedication to prayer and because they know the character of these men and their relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks of laying hands on another often. Jesus laid his hands on children in Matthew 19. Yairus begging Jesus to lay hands on his dying daughter, Mark 5 verse 23. And Jesus' ministry, laying on of hands, is related to blessing and healing. In the church, some receive the Holy Spirit when an apostle lays his hands on them. Um, that we will later see in Acts 8, 9 and 19. But most receive the Holy Spirit without any ritual. Jesus did not commission the apostles to lay his hands on them, but the early church does ordain those set aside for a special ministry with them by laying their hands on them. And that we will also see in Acts 13 that we will study later and Timothy 4. It appears the laying on of hands is a cultural practice as the Bible describes it but doesn't command it. Let's continue with verse 7. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and the large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Verse 9. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Now some of the priests, many of whom probably witnessed these two trials, come to a saving faith in Christ. Maybe they are convicted of what they did to Jesus. could also be that they see the confidence and freedom of Peter and the others who had fled when Jesus was arrested. Our faithfulness to Jesus can be a strong beacon to others, even if we if, if we failed him in the past. Now, seeing that Stephen is, is, is in the main role here, let's, let's talk about Stephen. Uh, we don't know much about Stephen. Uh, scriptures don't mention him uh, beyond the context of Acts 6 and 7. We, don't, we do ever know that he is an Hellenist, Hellenist Jewish Christian. Now, Hellenist Jewish Christians means that um, that the Jews they are not from Jerusalem. They were from outside Jerusalem, somewhere else in Rome, in the Roman Empire, uh, where the primary language was not Aramaic, but it was Greek. That was the language that, that Stephen spoke. Now, Stephen was one of well-known apostles that Jesus chosen. He is a, a, of a good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom and some other members of the church choose him to be of the first deacons. Other Hellenist, Hellenist Jews cannot match his wisdom. He was quite good used by the Holy Spirit. That's looking at the new term that um, comes into play is the, the term freedmen. Freedmen, and that is a blanket name for um, former slaves and their descendants. Now, in the first century BC, 
before Christ, the Roman general Pompey captured slaves, Jews actually, and enslaved them. And they took them to Rome to work for them. Now the Jewish slaves was very religious and they followed their religion very strictly, including the refusing to work on the Sabbath day, which is one of the big, one of the laws of the uh, 603 um, precepts that the, the Jews had to obey by. And um, they also strictly obeyed the, the kosher law that was in play at that time. They were basically, that made them basically useless as slaves. So, because they were so religious, they couldn't do anything. They weren't allowed to work uh, on Sundays. And for that reason, the General Pompey released these guys because they can't be used um, as they should have. The freedmen as are ascendants of these people and some other former slaves. Now, these Serenians are from Serene, which are in a model, modern day Libya as it stands today. And the Alexandrians are from Alexandra in Egypt. Now, at the time described in the space age, both these cities have large populations of Jews. Uh, you will see there's a map, um, and um, the, the, pla the place Sicilia on the map here is, is, is a province on the southeast coast of modern day Acer Minor. The place Tarsus, this is the place where, uh, from the Bible where Paul comes from, is in Sicilia. Asia, in this context, does not mean the eastern continent, means something else. In Stephen's area, um, the term Asia referred to a province in the western part of modern, Asia, modern day Asia Minor, and this includes uh, Troas, Ephesus, Colossae, and the other churches which is mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3. I think Pergamum is one of them, and so on. Uh, Revelation 2 to 3 uh, capture all these, have all these places, names of these places. Paul will, will spend two to three years in Ephesus. Uh, read more about it in, in Acts 19. Uh, it is the Jews, it's the Jews, sorry, from Asia who um, are eventually get him arrested in Jerusalem. In, and read about that in Acts 21. Let's continue our reading from verse 11 to 12. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Well, Filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen has dominated a debate with Hellenist Jews in Jerusalem. Instead of listening to Stephen's words, his opponents responded with treachery. Jews from Africa and the modern-day Asia Minor incite a crowd so that the Sanhedrin will condemn Stephen. And you know what? The Sanhedrin was just so happy to oblige because they hate these Christian followers. They absolutely hate them. Let's continue with verse 4, 13. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stopped speaking against his holy place and against the law. Uh, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. Now already here we can see that the persecution of the, the apostles and Jesus is starting to pick up. The Jews don't like what they're doing. So the Jews incited others to accuse Stephen of saying that Jesus will destroy the temple and, and change the Mosaic law. But Stephen's defense explains that the temple is not uh, necessarily a, prop, a proper God worship place in Acts 7, 1 to 50. In fact, in less than 40 years, uh, from what history tells us, the Roman army um, burned down the temple to the ground, nothing left. So the temple is not a place that can, in, that can enclose uh, God. God is, is, is um, omnipotence. Is one of the characteristics everywhere. It can't be kept in a box or in a place. 
uh, a temple after all is just uh, a building where they worshiped and get together to uh, gather together in the name of Jesus or oh, in, in the name of God and Jesus the Hellenist Jews uh, do realize that their argument is actually very weak um, they convinced false witnesses to charge Stephen with nonsense and uh, negative and false false uh, facts. Moving forward to today's time, um, and particularly in America, we can see that the same kind of act is playing off in America today. How the leftist politicians um, using false witnesses to do the exact same thing that the Jews did in that time, uh, to do their bidding for them, to use them as instruments of falsehood and lies. Now, uh, a common slur was that nothing can come, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. John 1 verse 46. Fortunately for, for Stephen's accusers, most of the Sanhedrin is more interested in preserving their hold over people than the truth. As in today, it's not really going about the truth. It's not about uh, spreading the truth, but it's more about power. Holding on to what they have, hold over people. Exactly the same what happened in today's politics. Let's continue our reading from verse 15. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. You know, in our culture today, we see fat little angels with tiny little wings on the clouds and play the harp and and they are all these benevolent beings and they're only here to serve and protect us and fill us with peace. What a lie that is. What a lie that is. We tend to think that someone with a face like an angel is sweet and innocent. This leads to an assumption that Stephen looked harmless, benevolent, or peaceful, that's not necessarily false here. But the ancient concept of angels wasn't docile or quiet. Angels in the Bible were more likely to send their witnesses to their knees and tremble of fear. Virtually every single person in Scripture who sees an angel immediately has to be told not to be afraid. We can read this in Matthew 28 verse 5, Luke 1 verse 11 to 13, and Luke 2 verse 10, and Acts 10 verse 3 to 4. After David took an ill-advised census, an angel killed 70,000 men. In 2 Samuel 24 verse 15 to 16, another being described using the term angel killed 185,000 members in the Sennacherib's army and 2 Kings 19 verse 35. Daniel fell to his face in fear when an angel visited him in Daniel 8 verse 17. In short, angels are massively powerful warriors in God's army. Definitely not chubby infants with wings sitting on the clouds and playing cute harps. To say Stephen's face reminded his audience of an angel speaks more of the evidence of God's power in his life than anything else. What the Sanhedrin and everyone else they saw scared them. It put fear in their hearts. It reminded them of, of their sin. It brought out something powerful, mighty. Not something sweet and innocent, but something powerful. Something they didn't like. Something they didn't like at all. Stephen is clearly not offenseless either. He is filled with the Holy Spirit, boldly speaking words of truth, and his adversaries are powerless to refute anything. The only reason he is before this council is because his op opponents have resorted to lies and deceit, and the council is more than willing to condemn a Jesus follower. Listen. This is what Satan does, and this is what all his children in this world do. If they cannot, they cannot come up against you legally 
and truthfully, they will lie. They will get people to lie for them. They will make witnesses and lie for them. With any means possible, they will do it. And we see it today in the world. We see it today everywhere on our televisions. It has always been this way. It, it never changed. It never changed. Well, this concludes our video um, for this week. And I hope you've learned something and enjoyed it just as much as, as Abel and I did. And um, may God bless you for the rest of the week until we talk to you again next week. Goodbye. Thank you for watching our video and uh, Shalom. Hey, 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 before you go, before you go, if you haven't subscribed yet, please click the subscribe button, uh, share and like the videos. Let's spread this good news to as many people as we can. Bye.